So, this morning as we jump into Colossians, uh, one of the things that I want to share with you is my intent last week when I thought we would go through this um, epistle to the church at Colossians was that it was going to be um, a very quick uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4. And I just thought that that might be something that would be very um, uh, easy to do, uh, pretty much do a Cliff Notes version of each chapter, and then we'd move on, and uh, hopefully by the end of uh, this epistle, we'd be back at the church and we could pick up uh, Acts again. Well, the longer that I dwelt in this epistle, the more that I really came to understand that I couldn't get through it, boom, boom, boom. I mean, I could, but I probably shouldn't. And so in that, uh, I came to a fulcrum point at the middle of the week. It was either continue to go forward or just throw in the towel and the go to, you know, little short studies each week. But for where we are, where the church is today, uh, our church and the church uh, universal, where we're at, I, I think uh, Colossians is something that we need to pay attention to, we need to receive, we need to hear, because, you know, the... The garb changes, the climate changes, rulers change, governments change, everything changes, but two things, man's need of a redeemer Mm -hmm. and man himself. We we still are a sinning bunch of people. We still at times think we can make it right with the Father all on our own. We got a game plan and this is what we're going to do and gosh, if that isn't good enough for God, then hmm, we don't need him anyway, right? I mean... Some people think that. That's their, their game plan. What's your plan? I'm going to do the best I can. Well, what if that isn't good enough? Well, if that's not good enough for God, then I really don't need God. Okay, if that's your game plan, see how that works out for you when you enter into eternity. Because it's not going to work out for you. And no matter how adamant, no matter how passionate you are, no matter how much you can point to this, that, and the other thing, the evil in the world that you're better than, the guy next door to you that you do things that are way different than him, but he says he's a Christian, no matter how much you can do that, if you do not have that relationship with the Father through the death and the resurrection of his son Jesus Christ, you got nothing. You got nothing but eternal death. And I know I said that wrong, and I did that on purpose. <laughs> um, so, so in Colossians, in the, the four chapters that we're going to go through, uh, chapter 1 is Christ's preeminence declared. Chapter 2 is preeminence defended. Chapter 3 is preeminence seen in our lives. And chapter 4 is preeminence in church service. So we're going to talk about service. We're going to talk about a lot of things. But, but what needs to become apparent to us is that you're not saved by your works. Okay? Because there's a lot that attend churches. There's a lot within fellowships that are working their way to heaven. Okay, that's how that works. You know, I'm on the highway to heaven. You thought I was going to say something else, right? No, I'm on the highway to heaven. And in that, I, I've gotten this step, I've gotten this step, I've gotten this step, I've got... And, and they keep stepping their way into a closeness with a God of their creation, with the Father of their creation, not the Father who's created them. And so Paul is, he's imprisoned in Rome. He writes this letter to the to the Colossians, to the, the church at Colossians. And as he writes this letter, he's coming against a heresy, a heresy called Gnosticism. And you hear a word like that and you think, wow, must be one of those old time diseases, right? Like gout used to be prevalent. You know, it is still, but not so much. There used to be a lot of things that, you know, were very prevalent in the day, but aren't so much anymore. And so you hear the word Gnosticism, and you think, whew, glad we got through that puppy. But the thing that is, we, we are still in the midst of that. And what the Gnostics of the day brought forth is pretty much the same as the Gnostics uh, of today, what they bring forth. And that's the fact that you might be saved, but there's more to it. 
you, you might think you have that relationship that secures you in Christ, but wait, wait, kind of like that bad TV commercial, buy one and wait a minute, we'll send you two of these things for the price of one. And, and that's the Gnostic heresy. There's a group of folks that have a special knowledge, but only they can have it. There's a group of folks that really know the... Yeah, I wish I could I wish I wish could tell you, but then I'd probably have to kill you. So I can't tell you, but I can just hold it over your head and, and, and tell you how much you're missing out because you don't have the special knowledge. And those people exist today. You, you hear them question somebody's salvation, not because of what they see in that person, because we can be, I mean, we can be fruit inspectors. We're not to be hypocrites. We're not to be uh, lording over people. We're not to be, but, but we can look at somebody and by what they're doing, we can come alongside of them and encourage them that perhaps there's something they should be doing different. We can do that and not be hypocrites as long as we do it in love. But these people are people who come alongside those within the church who indeed are saved, but perhaps don't walk and talk and look according to what they think they need to walk and talk and look according to. And they will throw that seed of doubt, that seed of question. You ever had somebody do that to you? Oh, that was just so awesome what you did. And you're thinking, well, I don't need to hear that. But okay, that was, no, it it was so right on. And they can be talking about anything, a meal you made or what you did at work or, you know, an investment. And then they throw something, but. And then they throw the but word in there and then they kind of sprinkle some seed on it, grass seed. Or not grass seed, weed seed. And then everything they just said, it's kind of now, it's like question mark in the Mysterians, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of go, Okay, was it good? Was it not? Was it? And so Paul, as he writes this letter to the Colossians, he, he wants to assure them that their sufficiency is in Christ and Christ alone. Christ and Christ alone. And in doing so, Paul ruffles feathers. Because remember in the day, if you had power, then you had control. Pretty much like some men and women and kids think it works today. If you hold all the cards and you got all the power, it doesn't work that way. If you hold all the cards, you just got all the cards. It doesn't mean you hold the power. It doesn't mean you got the cards. And in the past and in the present, many seek to discourage those within the body of Christ with words that have no meaning, meaning only to these folks. No meaning to anybody else. They're about this doctrine and that doctrine and, and this heresy and, and, and that heresy and, and and this I guess what's the word for it that everybody you know always comes up with these um, plots that everybody you know everybody's got a plot everybody's got this every you know and the problem is is if you're oh I'll go there oh I'll listen to him oh I'll do that I'll do, you you can't give the preeminence to Jesus Christ you can't and if you're not giving the preeminence to Jesus Christ, then you are going to be led astray. You are going to end up uh, getting involved with time wasters, time suckers, thoughts that you don't need to be part of, things that you don't need to hear about. You are now going to be put in a place of weakness. You're going to be put in a place where rather than focus on Christ, well, if I don't do this, then this is not going to be for my good. If I don't do that, that's not... And you become to and fro with everything. And Paul is writing to the church so that he can get rid of this very small group of elite people who have a special knowledge that others do not possess. And for our sake today, we'll call those folks not the special chickens, because we're special chickens, right? <laughs> we will call them the really, really, really special chickens. Because they think they got a knowledge that's important when really all they have is a uh, knowledge of a philosophy, of an idea that, that puffs up rather than draws close. Reading out of John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. Scripture tells us, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
and we beheld his glory, the only, or the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God ever present, Jesus ever present, the Holy Spirit ever present, God in the Old Testament showing who he was to men, but not revealing to them what he looked like. Remember Moses? There's a bush. It's burning. I'm going to look at the glory of God, and God said, no, you better hide your face, son. You better hide your face. And so the Old Testament was God present. Absolutely. Was Jesus present? Absolutely. Was the Holy Spirit there? Absolutely. Go to Genesis, the account. All present, the Godhead. But for us in New Testament times, God chose to reveal who he is through sending his son, Jesus Christ. God with clothes on, Jesus Christ. Now that might sound simple, that might sound very mundane, but some of us don't have that picture. God so loved that he sent his son to dwell amongst us. His son being tempted in all ways as we were tempted. Yet succumbing to what? None of that. His son dying upon a cross, making reconciliation possible through his death and taking upon himself the sins of the world. And not only dying that death that would reconcile, but being raised from death to show that power over death. And now sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for all of us. Have you ever thought of that picture of your Savior Jesus Christ? Man, I wish somebody or somebody understood what I was in the middle of. I wish somebody just got what was going on. And you know Jesus, he's at the right hand of the Father. He knows exactly what you're in the middle of because he's in the middle of that with you. He knows exactly what's going on because the Holy Spirit is pouring out of you that which was pouring into you. And, and in the Godhead, as we go through Colossians this morning, it's a picture of the preeminence of Jesus Christ in our lives. And if you can't say he has the preeminence, and this is my saying, so I know a lot of um, commentators or pastors would, would disagree, don't give him number one in your life. You know, well, in my life, God's number one. Jesus is number one. The Holy Spirit's number one. Well, who's number two? Well, my bride. She's number two in my life. Don't do that. Because if you've got a number one, you've got a number two, they're, they're always vying for position, right? Give God the preeminence in your life. If you don't know what to do, then seek Him. If you think you're doing right, still seek Him. If he's given you a blessing, praise him. Everything that we say and do, we're to give him the preeminence. And then my wife can be number one in my life. Right, Darren? <laughs> <laughs> She's not saying anything over there. <laughs> I have to get back to the water ones here. Isn't it great we have this wind? Yeah, mm -hmm. nice breeze. It is awesome, huh? So before we read chapter 1 and we go a little bit further, I want to get you guys caught up. I should have done it before. Um, yesterday we sent emails to, um, to those that are on the city council in Wildemar. We sent emails to those that are our senators in California. Sent emails to those that are our representatives on the board of supervisors as well in Riverside. Sent uh, emails to uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. And uh, sent an email um, just kind of informing them of how we've been trying to be obedient to um, the dictates that have been coming out of Sacramento. Uh, inform them of the size of our fellowship and the size of our sanctuary. We've got about 293 allocated seats in our sanctuary. And on, uh, on a really good Sunday, I guess a Sunday of my imagination, we've got about 50 people. So. Probably not, but in, um, in painting that picture for them of 293 available seats, uh, a population of 50 or less, the fact that a, a lot of us are more advanced in age than younger in age, 
and that uh, we've been trying to be obedient to the laws of the land, I asked for a waiver from uh, each one that I sent the email to. And uh, I got two responses, um, which were encouraging because they responded, uh, both from local leaders, which is fine, and they informed me that they really were not in a position to be able to override the laws of the state of California. And I was appreciative of the response. I got another response from somebody else, and they informed me that uh, of the same thing, that the laws of the state of California, they're subject to as well as we are. They couldn't override that, but they assured me that there was absolutely no way they had enough resources to enforce those laws. <laughs> so, <laughs> a little between the line reading there, you know. Uh, so that was encouraging because at least they got back to us. So kind of an update, uh, Pastor John MacArthur um, in San Fernando Valley, uh, he got a, um, I guess, an injunction lifted or a stay, one or the other. I don't know what to call it. But their church is now able to meet indoors uh, with social distancing and masks and those type of things. So uh, that was a late ruling on Thursday, Friday. And they'll be meeting today indoors. Mm -hmm. So even though that wasn't a blanket, we get to do this in California, it was at least a step in the right direction. So I'm hoping that perhaps next week uh, things will loosen up and maybe by the end of the week rather than being in the backyard, which, which is awesome for us. We love seeing all you guys in here trampling the weeds down so I don't have to mow them as often. Um, but we might be over at uh, the church meeting. But uh, look on the webpage, uh, look in your emails and we'll let you know that for sure. So all of that, which I should have said before, let me read through... Uh, Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 29. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God, or to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it is also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Verse 9, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, 
of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, uh, to his working which works in me mightily. That was a long chapter, huh? Some run-on sentences and everything else. I don't think Paul would fare well in our modern um, English section at school. You'll probably <laughs> get called on the carpet. So, in what we're going to discuss today, we're going to probably get through the greeting that Paul uh, brought forward to the church, and we're going to get through a couple of verses on uh, him speaking of their faith in Christ. I want to read before we get started out of John chapter 10, verses 1 through 22. So this is Jesus speaking. So this is something that we probably should uh, pay attention to and listen to. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So he who does not come through the door, some other way he finds to get to where he's inside the sheepfold. Jesus says he's a thief and a robber. Verse 2. Jesus once again says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings them out, his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. See, there are a lot of voices going on within the churches, within society. Some are saved, some are not saved, some are sheep, some are wolves. But what we have to do is we have to listen very carefully to what we hear, and we have to place that before the Lord, back to that word preeminence, we have to place that before the Lord and ask the Lord, is this of you? Is this what I should be hearing? Is this what I should be following? Is this what I should be modeling? Because there are many that come in and they're wolves, but they're in sheep's clothing. There's many that come in that are sheep, but they're sheep being led astray. They're sheep, but they're being led astray. Reading verse 6, of John Chen. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And will go in and out and find pasture. That's the gospel right there. That is the gospel in a nutshell. If anyone enters by me, he will what? Be saved. And he will go in and out and find what? Pasture. He will find grass to graze on, things that will nourish him, things that will take and cause him to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. A hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not 
care about the sheep. See, when the going gets rough, the shepherds stand tall. When the going gets rough, the hirelings just get going. That make sense? And we see that in so many different areas of Christian life. Well, it got a little too tough for me, so I'm not hanging in there. I'm just, I'm just leaving. And, and what that shows, what that says to those that are in our purview, is that, you know what? My faith was in my faith. My comfort was in all I had while I was comfortable. And now that there's no more comfort, I have no more faith. And now that I have no more faith, I, I, I'm, I'm out of here. And listen to the picture in verse 10 of John 10. The thief does not come except to steal. He's only there for one reason. He might look like a sheep, but he's a wolf. The thief does not come except to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. One flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. How important is Jesus Christ to you? Is he your all in all? Does he have the preeminence in your life? Because as Paul writes to the church at Colosh, he's writing to those that are saved. He's writing to those that are the sheep of his hand, the sheep in the fold. But there are those within that flock that have crawled up and over and gotten in ways that they shouldn't ought to got in, and they're trying to separate the sheep from the shepherd. They're trying to sow seeds of doubt, seeds of questioning, seeds of, well, you know, I know that you say that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I know that you have turned your life over to Him. But I see some areas of your life where if you, if you just knew this, if you just did that, if, if, you just, if you just did these things that I know that, well, they aren't in here, no. Well, they are, but you just can't find them, you just can't see them, they're hidden from you. But, but I can lead you, I, I can show you, I can, I can take and give you that, that, that final, uh, over the top of salvation. So then you'll know that you'll know that you'll know. And it's like, they're a bunch of wolves. They're a bunch of wolves. The simplicity of the gospel and the salvation of men is the simplicity of the gospel and the salvation of men. For God so loved that he gave. Jesus so loved that he came. Jesus so loved that he died and that he rose. Jesus so loved that he said, I must go that a better may come. What could be better than Christ amongst men? Than Jesus at your buffet table. What could be better than that? You being the Holy Spirit, or the, the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit of God. God actually choosing to indwell you. And for all New Testament believers, that's what happened. And so as we go forward in Colossians, I'm going to ask you a question. And this is asking you, but asking me, and so I'm taking it personal, you're taking it personal. There was a train conductor, and his job was to drive 
the train from point A to point B and B to C and C to D and so on and so forth. And every time he would get it to stop, he would cry out the name of the town. Every time he cried out the name of the town, there was an assumption that he knew about the town. Because this train, he's done this all his life, he's crying out the name of the town, he obviously knows something about the town, and he goes from town to town to town to town. But for this train conductor, it was just a job. He, he, he didn't need to know anything about the towns. He simply needed to know when he got to the towns. And he would cry out the town, and his passengers would hear whatever town was applicable to them, get off, and, and they would go find out about the town. Has our Christianity become similar to that of the conductor on a train? We have a basis of knowledge that we've acquired we really don't have anything past the knowledge because we've never really stepped out of the train and explored the town, but we're good at crying out to those about us who Jesus Christ is. But we've never really explored that for ourselves. We've, we've become like those parrots or those minor birds. We, we have enough information to give out things that make sense, but we have no application in our lives, and so because we have no application in our lives, really we can't be good leaders or good disciplers or good bringers of the gospel to those who need it. We're simply uh, placards that, that cry things out. You know, has anybody ever been to Disneyland? Okay, first part of the question. And have you ever been on the Jungle Cruise? Yes. I love the Jungle Cruise. No matter how many times I look at the backside of water, I'd love to see the backside of water. But you know, if you've ever been on the Jungle Cruise for any uh, amount of uh, journeying, whether it's through your youth or, or as you get older, there are those who are your guide that, I mean, they're just doing their job, right? And you can tell it. They give you all the pertinent facts. They make sure they tell you when things are going to happen. And at the end of the cruise, you wonder... Well, that guy must be, or gal must be having a bad day. That wasn't very exciting. But then you have other people. They actually want to draw you in to a place where they are that they want to take and make it come alive for you. And that's the difference between a conductor who never gets off the train and one who actually knows what's going on because he's been to each of these places that he's heralding. And so, for us as Christians, are we simply telling people about a Jesus that we've heard of? Or are we living Jesus in front of these people because he is our life? He is our all in all. He is, he is that whom we cling to through thick and thin, good, bad, or ugly, mm -hmm. rich or poor. And, and that's... What Paul is doing is he's writing to this church. He's, he's giving practical, biblical knowledge based upon his walk with the Lord, his relationship with the Lord. And he expects everybody else's relationship to be just as his. To live as Christ is, and to die as gain. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. When I was younger... Um, my dad got a car when, I think it was about 13, 13 and a half, 63 and a half Ford Galaxy Fastback. And it was burnt to the ground. I mean, it was absolutely toast. It was brand new, two weeks old. Um, I remember him telling my mom they bought a brand new car. My mom, mother of seven, his seven kids. <laughs> I, I remember her saying, if you want a new car, Bill, I'm going to kill you. You know, or something to that. It was loving, but it's something to that, you know. So, so we all piled in the country square. We went about two blocks from the home. My dad's so excited about this brand new car, two weeks old that he bought, this 63 and a half Ford Galaxy. And he pointed over to this house that was rubble. It was still smoking, you know, from, from the fire. Just completely incinerated the house, the garage with the car and everything else. And right in the middle of this garage, it was just nothing but ash was his brand new 63 and a half Ford Galaxy burnt to the ground. 
burnt to the ground. And my mom just looked at him, didn't say another word, take me home. We went home, and through, for the next two and a half years, my dad rebuilt that home. And he did hands-on every uh, chance that we would get that he thought we needed. Uh, we would go outside and clean out uh, this burnout car. Then he would take and shrink the body panels with, with heat and cold compresses. He'd get it hot, then he'd shrink it, and because the fire buckled everything, and he'd shrink everything back. And so we learned. We learned hands-on to be appreciative for a car that wasn't toasted. We learned to be appreciative for a smell that didn't smell like burnt anything. And we learned that through application and through living life. Well, then when my dad got the car done, he sold it to me. I was 15 and a half. Had myself a 63 and a half Ford Galaxy 390 with tri-power. And I'm like, man, am I going to have fun in this thing? But my dad, not wanting to tell me things, but wanting to show me, he took me out in the car. And we found a parking lot, I won't say where, Elsinore well, High School. And um, <laughs> after hours on a weekend, and uh, he said, now, Billy, what I want you to do is be respectful of this car. And I don't want you to abuse or get yourself in trouble. He goes, so what you never want to do is you never want to put your foot on the brake. You never want to take and put this automatic in low. You never want to make sure the car is tensioned. And then you never want to let go of the brake and slam on the gas, because this is what's going to happen. And he did that, and that car laid so much rubber. I mean, I, it was like, I'm thinking, do I have to go buy new tires now? What's going on here? You know, he's, he's ruining my tires. But, but the point is, Paul is writing to the church of Colossians, and they'll receive from him, because he had an application. He lived a life that uh, put these things into practice. My dad, you know, I knew what he was doing later on in life. He was showing me exactly what to do so I wouldn't get myself in trouble and I wouldn't break the car. But he was telling me not to do it at the same time. But he was giving me an example. And for us, in this day and age, we need to model Christ to those that were involved with, not crisis. When we trust others rather than Christ, we put Christ to the background, we elevate them to the position of preeminence, and whether we believe it or not, we now become a follower of men rather than a follower of Christ. And, you know, sometimes that saying is, don't sweat the little things, right? Don't sweat the small stuff. Go out and look at the coast. Go look at the sands that you stand upon. What is, what is the shoreline made up of, generally? Little things, right? And little things upon little things upon little things upon. And when they say, don't sweat the small stuff, sweat the small stuff. Because that's what the big stuff's made up on. When you wake up in the morning, you wake up on the foundation that you thought you were getting rid of the night before. If it's the foundation built upon Christ, wake up and keep building. If it's the foundation built upon crisis, wake up and make sure you confess, repent, get it out of the way, and, and start building again. But Paul's love was such for God's people that in prison, he wanted to disciple them. In prison, he wanted to minister to them. And, in prison, he wanted them to know his love for them. And so as we basically didn't even get through a verse today, <laughs> uh, we don't have to do the intro tomorrow as Neil comes forward and, and we end in the worship song. Um, my exhortation, my encouragement for all of us this week is to listen to what's going on in the world. We, we need to know. We need to, we can't be the ostriches with our heads in the sand. But as you listen to what's going on in the world, frame it with Christ having the preeminence. Mm -hmm. Ask him what he would have you to do. And Paul's in prison. I mean, he could be sitting there going, the Eeyore ministry, woe is me, it certainly is going to end well. But you know what? His focus was on the Lord, and the Lord had... Paul's focus then to be upon his people. Mm -hmm. And that's where we need to be, man. There's so many out there that are doing the shaky-jakey because 
every time they turn around, somebody's kicking them here and kicking them there and giving them this thought, giving them that thought. And we need to give them Christ and Him crucified. Yeah. We need to give them the gospel. And if we can't preach it to them, then we can sure, certainly live it before them. Yeah. Right?